Hello, fans of Acid Horizon. This is Craig here. Today, we have an interview with Will, Adam, and Stuart Eldon on the topic of the early Foucault. But before we get to that, I just want to say thank you to all the patrons who attended our most recent seminar and also those who have continued to support us throughout this venture. We wanted to let all listeners know that in early September, we are planning what we might call an early office hours for the fall semester of 2021. We hope that the seminar fulfills a few different purposes, one being to talk about writing from a philosopher's perspective. Also, we will talk about the ways in which we have written papers, some of the obstacles that we have encountered, and we want to field some of your ideas as well. Become a member on Patreon so that you can be part of that event. We have upcoming episodes with Matt Calhoun of Repeater Books, and also we have an episode on Bataille's essay, Torture. Okay, let's get to the interview. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, Adam and I are joined by Stuart Eldon, professor of political theory and geography at the University of Warwick. He's the author of a myriad of books ranging from Ken Guillaume to Shakespeare and, of course, Foucault. He runs a blog, Progressive Geographies, which we will link in the show notes. He's here with us today to discuss his most recent work, which is on the early academic life of Michel Foucault, or as he described it in a lecture, Foucault with hair. The early Foucault is available in print today at Polity Press. So thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Eldon. Our first question is very general, which is just how can Foucault's early academic experience, his clinical interests, and so on? help us understand the broader trajectory of his philosophical project. Okay, so thank you first for inviting me uh, to talk to you about the book. I suppose if you look at the History of Madness, which is the first major book that Foucault publishes, comes out in 1961. And there's a number of things in that book that anticipate later things that Foucault will work on. So there's an interest in medicine, there's an interest in exclusion, which plays out particularly in later work in, in Discipline and Punish. Foucault makes some comments about sexuality, which of course he will develop much later in the history of sexuality. There's material about the organization of knowledge and so on. So many of the themes of the later Foucault are in a sense anticipated by that first major work. And many of the secondary studies of Foucault begin with that work. They, they begin with the history of madness as the first major study. What I was interested in doing in this book was to say how did Foucault come to write that book? What was the steps in his career? What was the process by which he did the research? How did, how did this book sort of materialize? And secondly, what was Foucault doing before this book that was going in different directions, paths that he perhaps didn't take later on in his career? And so rather than beginning with the history of madness, what I wanted to do in this book was in a sense to end with the history of madness, was to sort of talk about what Foucault had been doing as an academic for a decade before this book, some of which I think does lead him to write the history of madness, but other things open up different ways, different perspectives, different um, approaches or questions, things that Foucault was interested in. And some of those, I think, perhaps shed light on what Foucault does in the later parts of his career. And others are just clearly things that he was interested in for a while, and then he moved on. He changed his mind. He became interested in something different. He abandoned some of those approaches or he broke with some of those um, interests that he had. But with the material that's now available, and we can maybe go into that in, in some more detail, but with the, the newly available archival material and, and other sources, I thought there was something that could be said about the, the Foucault before he became famous, the Foucault before the history of madness. I think that's that's great, and I think it's 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 fascinating to see sort of the the dialogue that sparked up surrounding um, the archives being being opened. You know, especially considering comments made to 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 Erbke Bear uh, and the, then the decision by Defer to 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 open this up uh, for research. What was it? What was it like to to, to access that material? I, I can't even imagine. I mean, my French is horrendous, so I could never even <laughs> I could never even ponder just what it would look like but but uh what was it what was it like to to approach that material um i mean it's fascinating and the the way i described it when i was working on uh, discipline and punish and i was reading foucault's reading notes so so things that he had taken when he'd been in the library to do the research for that book i i said it was kind of like taking the back off back off, off a clock <laughs> 
something that works, something that you know that's familiar, that seems very straightforward, and then you start to see, oh, how did it all come together? What were the things that he was interested in? What were the processes that got him there? What, what were the choices that he made and so on? And the, the archives have been progressively opened up in the period that I've been working on Foucault with the earlier two books in the, in this series, Foucault's Last Decade and Foucault, The Birth of Power, I used the archives to a, a growing extent as I was doing those those books. I used the archives much more extensively to write this book on the early Foucault. Um, that's partly because Foucault published relatively little in the period that this book is interested in, but he wrote quite a lot. So there's a lot of material in the archives that um, sheds light on on things that he for whatever reason, chose not to publish. Some of that material is in the process of being published at the moment. But the the archives are are a fascinating uh, source, both of information, but also for kind of getting an insight into some of the processes by which Foucault worked. Uh, For example, the the second and third volumes, The History of Sexuality, which is some of the earliest available material in the archives, there, there's not just a single draft of an early version of that text, but there's multiple drafts of each of the chapters of that text. And because Foucault's writing this in the early 1980s, he would write by hand, he would give it to a typist at the Collège de France who would then type up and have to deal with his handwriting. And so a typescript would come back with lots of question marks and lots of kind of gaps where there was a Greek word or something and they, they wanted Foucault to fill this in. Foucault would then take that typed version of the text and then write on that to edit the, for the next version. Sometimes he would cut a strip from one typed page, paste it onto a new sheet, write a linking passage, and then paste another sheet, a strip of, of, of manuscript. And the, he would build up these texts, and you could see the kind of the material process by which he was working as he was doing this. So I gained some sense of how Foucault wrote um, the process of writing. And the the material that we have is incomplete. There's a lot of material that, for whatever reason, has been lost or destroyed. That's often because once Foucault had published a book, he would tend to get rid of the draft material that had led to the writing of that book. He didn't need it. He didn't want it. Um, You sometimes find pages of early drafts of books that have then been reused as scrap paper for taking notes on something completely different and so on. So there's a lot of kind of material things that I found interesting. Um, some correspondence sometimes is just sort of folded in half and used to group notes on a particular topic, but you open that up because you're interested in the topic and then you find a letter that, ah, okay, that links this to this and you can, you can join up another part of the story. So the material is interesting both in terms of its content, but also in terms of its form, but there's so much material. The main archive at the, the Bibliothèque Nationale, which is the material that was in Foucault's apartment that Daniel de Fer sold in 2013, I think, is 37,000 pages of material in that collection. That is the most extensive of the archives, but that's only one of of a few archives that have got material. So there's an enormous amount of material. Not all of it has been catalogued. And then there are bits and pieces that you find in in other people's archives, you know, a text that Foucault gave to somebody else that now is in that person's archive and so on. So yeah, fascinating. and, And I've found it really helpful in joining up some of the things that I knew about already, um, but also taking things in different directions that were not anticipated. Uh, that's, a, that's I, I think, uh, given the nature of the, the project you've set out for yourself, it, it seems like it's going to necessitate those sort of shifts in approach, which kind of answers the next question, but I'll ask it formally anyway. I'm wondering, given the, the fact that when we look at Foucault's last decade and the birth of power, you do actually have the lectures at the College de France, which of course function a lot more smoothly than right the back of that clock. I, I'm working my way through through those lectures. Some of them I'm working through again now just for grad school purposes. And it's remarkable just how quickly he'll run through work that was clearly done uh, in the history of madness on Touque and Pinel. And even Loray, which comes back in in psychiatric power briefly to to sort of now play a completely new function. These are it's fascinating to see how material is still used, but now has an entirely different purpose in the political theory of Foucault. And I'm wondering, uh, given that Foucault was extensive in the vastness of of just his physical research, 
but relatively reserved about the early parts of his career. You, you'll you'll very rarely um you you'll very rarely get a description of what he was doing. There are some in the Crit collection where he discusses his father um but what uh, really shocked me in the introduction was this description of the two libraries that he had uh, when he was growing up. I'm not sure if this is the introduction, but it's quite early in the book where uh, his mother has a, a primarily literary collection and his father has an extensively medical collection and he doesn't have access to that material. Um, yeah. And that tends to sort of be an ongoing, the, the, the nature of the legitimation of knowledge and the processes through which uh, scientific discourses occur and Foucault's relationship to the literary and the scientific and how those two are are constantly in dialogue in Madness and Civilization. I thought it was a fantastic little picture to paint. So in, in that sense, I, I've, I've really been enjoying the work just at the level of seeing these resonances between Foucault's academic life and his academic work. But given that he was always kind of reserved in talking about his life and and I think even in the question, I, I mentioned that even Deleuze would hesitate to, to describe the nature of his relationship to music, which early in his life was, was very important. Did that pose a sort of problem when you, were, when you were dealing with his work? Because a lot of that early period did come down to like physical experiences that he had in particular places, uh, not just texts that he'd been exposed to, but teachers that he had. So did that force you to have to uh, change your approaches to what you were looking for in these archives? To, to an extent, yes. I think that in the 70s and 80s, which was the focus of the previous two books, there is so much material. Uh, there's so much secondary material. The interviews that Foucault gave in that part of his career are very extensive. And as Foucault became more and more famous, sort of every time that Foucault spoke somewhere, visiting talks, somebody would have a tape recorder in the room whether those were always published or whether those tape recordings were just circulating. Often now those tape recordings are actually gold dust for the editors because they allow them to, to reconstruct a lecture that Foucault gave. But in the early part of Foucault's career, he's obviously just not famous. And so he's very rarely asked to give an interview. There's questions about technology at that time in the 1950s and the 1960s. Tape recorders were just not the portable things that they became in the 70s and 80s. And so many of the lectures that we know Foucault gave, there seems to be no recorded record of them. So it's much harder to reconstruct what Foucault was doing in, in the period of the early Foucault, which is, is largely on the 1950s, and the book I'm currently writing, which is on the 1960s. There are some recordings, there are some transcripts, there are other uh, sources that you can use for what he was teaching, what he was interested in and so on, but, it, but it's harder to do than the 70s and 80s for which we have a much more extensive record. I mean, the biographers, Didier Erebon and David Macy particularly, have explored the, the period I'm working on in the, these books. And often they give some very useful clues as to what was happening or sources that might tell more about what was happening in a particular period. And in terms of music, um, the most important person that Foucault knew, who was a, a, a composer, was Jean Barraquet, who he had a relationship with in the um, early to mid-1950s. And there's a, a very good biography of Jean Barraquet by Paul Griffiths that was also really useful for, for making some connections or at least telling me where to look for certain things. But because Foucault's not giving interviews about his work in the 1950s or even really in the first half of the 1960s, there's very few interviews from that period because he's just not the famous figure that he later becomes. So there isn't the interest in his work at that time. So it, it's harder to kind of connect, to, to join the dots between particular parts of Foucault's work. But while Didier Erebon and David Macy had access to a lot of people who knew Foucault in this time, they were able to interview Foucault's colleagues, his friends, often even his teachers, because Foucault was so young relatively when he died that even his teachers were still alive when those biographies were being researched. Very few people that knew Foucault in the 1950s are still alive. I mean, there's, there's many people that knew Foucault in the 60s, 70s, 80s that, that are still alive, but very few for that earliest period. And yet I had access to the archives, as do other researchers today, that David Macy and Didier Erebon just didn't have access to. The material just wasn't available at the time they did the biographies. So I was able to approach this material to an extent with limitations, because there just weren't the people to ask, there weren't the recorded traces, there weren't the interviews and so on. 
but there was this material um, that had not been available to a previous generation of researchers that I and others who are working on these these kinds of issues were able to access. So I think that opened up a lot of different ways of, of thinking about this material, of engaging with that material. And it was a different challenge to the, to the writing of the books on the 70s and 80s. Uh, but it was a, a fascinating one because I, I learned, I probably learned more about Foucault in the writing of this book than I have with any of the other projects I've done on Foucault because Foucault publishes so little in this period and yet he's doing such a lot. And in a sense, that's what the book tries to show is, you know, why was Foucault only publishing very little in the 1950s, even though he was doing a lot of different things at that time? Oh, it seems like part of the challenge of constructing this book was how much Foucault was trying to put these materials out of his own reach. Because what struck me was how Will was mentioning the mother and father's library. And the only way that we, we, we have the, the Hegel essay today is that Foucault's brother found it in his mother's library. And it's, it's interesting the various ways he tried to make, he tried to make Hegel sort of go behind him. And you can see the sort of tracing all the way from his sort of flight away from Hippolyte into the, uh, the French Nietzscheans of like Bataille and you know in that sort of post Kojevian era, away from the idea of you know Hegel's this person who's always standing there motionless. And I'm wondering how much you can sort of trace this you know, line of flight somewhat away from this this original because I mean if everyone everyone's a bit embarrassed at the master's piece. I mean that's, I'm probably just projecting, but <laughs> I think that's interesting. That I mean the Hegel piece is this nineteen forty nine diploma uh, thesis that that as you said, Johnny Polit is the um, supervisor for this. And people had thought this was lost. Uh, we knew about it. We knew the title, uh, which is the, the, Constitution of the, Phenom- uh, the Constitution of the Transcendental in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. But for many years, um, people had thought this was lost. And there wasn't a copy in Foucault's own apartment, as you said. And it was in Foucault's mother's house um, that it was found. I think there's a, a simple answer for why that material and other material from the early 1950s and some from the late 1940s was in his mother's house. I think Foucault simply moved the material there when he moved to Uppsala in 1955. I think it was as simple as that he wasn't going to be able to take everything with him when he was going into this visiting post in Uppsala. So he took it home and he just didn't look at it again. And the, the material that's in that uh, font, that collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale, has got you know, the gems like the, the Hegel thesis, it's got draft material for Foucault's earliest publications in the 1950s. But it's also got all sorts of other things. It's got his Communist Party membership cards, it's got his driving insurance, it's got, you know, just all sorts of bits and pieces that he had clearly kept. And that's all there. And I suspect that Foucault just never opened up those boxes again. Um, you know, I wonder how many people have got boxes of their stuff that's in their mother's attic that, you know, they haven't touched. And and that's what we have with with that material of Foucault's life. I, I think that's right. And some of the material from that early part of his career, he clearly kept with him because it was still useful for him. If it was going to be something he was going to teach on, for example, or his early 1950s course on philosophical anthropology, that's clearly a manuscript that he took with him to Hamburg and then back to Paris partly because I think it was useful when he was working on Kant's anthropology as his secondary thesis, both to do the translation of the anthropology and to write the long essay that, that introduces it. And so that was a, the, the folder that that manuscript is in has got a Hamburg address and then back in the Paris address written on it and crossed out. So he was clearly keeping some material with him that was useful for, for the ongoing research. We don't have very many traces of what Foucault was doing in the later part of the 1950s. And again, I think that's partly because Foucault was traveling all the time. He was in Uppsala for three years, then Warsaw, then Hamburg. We have the reading notes that were used for the history of madness and the birth of the clinic, which Foucault did some research on when he was in Uppsala. But we don't have really any traces of what Foucault was teaching in Uppsala in Hamburg, other than when it's recorded by somebody else, when somebody else has, has kept notes or when there's a, a oral history that somebody's given about what Foucault was doing or something that took me an enormous amount of time, which was going back through old Swedish newspapers through the events listings, because they, I found by chance that they'd listed one lecture that Foucault gave in Stockholm 
and it looked like a part of a series. So I went back through every Tuesday through 1954 and 55 and 56 to, you know, backwards and forwards, because that allowed me to reconstruct the titles of all of the lecture courses that Foucault gave in Stockholm. But that that's because there's so little material there that it, it, it felt worthwhile to do this because it gave me a bit of an insight into what Foucault was doing. And even though the Paris archives are incredibly extensive, they'd occasionally be, you know, a sort of tantalizing indication in somebody else's note that something else might exist somewhere. And then I'd go looking for, well, where might that be? One text, this was a radio lecture that Foucault gave in 1957 for a German radio station that was in Switzerland. And it, what it looks like is that Foucault wrote a text in French, which was translated into German, that was read on the, the radio uh, as a broadcast. And the German translation exists in the Swiss Literary Archive. And so that was a trip to Bern to, to find that, that piece, because there's so little material from the later part of the 1950s. This seemed a worthwhile thing to, to, to track down. So, yeah, some things took an enormous amount of time for a relatively small part of the story. And then there's the riches of the, the archives where, in a sense, there's almost too much information. And then it's how do you, you try and tell a story through that material? No, I think, I think that's indicative of the nature of a lot of Foucault's sort of intellectual tendencies, even in the 60s, too, right? Uh, travels always seem to be extraordinarily impactful on the nature of his work. Um, and the, the students he's working with at the time, the sort of broader intellectual milieu he's surrounded by. Uh, but one book that that obviously always sticks out uh, for folks interested in Foucault is is this sort of strange text, uh, uh, Mental Illness and, and Psychology, which is an edited version of a 1954 text. Can can you speak a little bit to the the kinds of changes, the the title differences between these two, and the the editing process that might indicate why the text that we see in I think sixty two is when it would would be officially published is in some ways fundamentally different because of what's removed than the original pieces of work that he put into to the text from fifty four. Sure. So, so 1954, Foucault is commissioned to write a book which is under the title of Mental Illness and Personality. It's published in French. It's in a introductory philosophy series. It was uh, Louis Althusser actually that made the introduction to the series editor Jean Lacroix that Foucault took up and and wrote this book effectively as a commission. And then, between 1954 and the early 1960s, Foucault does the research for the History of Madness. The History of Madness is first published in 1961. And I suspect partly capitalizing on Foucault's newfound sort of status, the publisher of Mental Illness and Personality wants to reprint the book. And Foucault, the story goes, tried to stop them, but his contract didn't allow them. They were allowed to do a new edition of this book sort of without his, his say. And Foucault's compromise is, okay, well, I'll take back the manuscripts and I'll edit it and I'll make it into a book that is more in keeping with where Foucault was, was in the early 1960s, let's say. He makes a number of changes in the first parts of the book, uh, but he takes out one chapter entirely, which is largely a chapter about Pavlov and kind of Marxist approaches to psychology. And he replaces that chapter with, one that's effectively a really condensed summary of the history of madness, so a kind of a historical analysis of it. And Foucault really doesn't like this, but this seems to be Foucault's kind of compromise position. He then is quite happy when the book seems to go out of print and the book doesn't get reprinted in France again in his lifetime. Now it's back in, in print in, in French in the, the Quadrige series and the, the translation was published in 1987, I think was the first English translation of this. But what's interesting is University of California Press, who wants to do a, a translation of the first edition, were refused permission to do an, a, a translation of the first edition. And, and the French publisher was trying to sort of take the moral high ground and say, you know, Foucault didn't like this book and he didn't want it published, and except that they were the publisher that had actually forced him into this and then brought the version that he, he did in 1962 back into, into circulation. So what I do in the book, and it's quite a long analysis, is there's a reading of the 1954 text. And then later in the book, there's a reading of 
how did Foucault come to revise this text in, in the early 1960s? So it's, it's chopping out that material that's quite Marxist in approach. It's more circumspect in terms of how Foucault approaches the, the existential approach to um, psychology, the Dasein analysis of, of Ludwig Binstanger and others. And it tries to provide a more historical chapter, which is a sort of survey of the history of madness. But Didier Erebon, Foucault's biographer, calls the book an batar, a kind of a mongrel or a bastard. It's a it's a hybrid text, the one that we have in English. It's got some material from 1954. It's got some material from 1962 that's sort of stitched together, you know, Frankenstein's monster kind of style. It's a it's an interesting historical document, but it's a very misleading text, I think, in terms of where Foucault was at either of those two periods. It doesn't give a real insight into where he was in 54, and it's a kind of compromise of where he was in the early 60s. So I, I wonder then, too, on top of that, if um, it may be worth discussing uh, Foucault's PCF membership briefly and the sorts of uh, circles that 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 put him in i i know that there are some biographers who who argue that it, it it it's largely a sort of byproduct of working with folks like althusser at the time and this was sort of a natural process to go through but foucault spent a lot of time in the 60s by by sartre and others uh being accused of, I think the famous line in the review was the last barricade of of the bourgeois against revolution, and of course Foucault is a cheeky reply, but which is that the poor bourgeoisie, right? They, all they have left is is this archivist. <laughs> but um, this also just seems to be a natural process that uh, that French intellectuals go through. They're part of this organization, and then they're just as quickly turned into into one of its greatest enemies. And that would be that same process would occur with uh, Sartre, right? And, and the lamentations at the beginning of uh, his lecture, "Existentialism is Humanism," and then, of course, finally Louis Althusser becomes a problem for for them in in um, the late '60s and early '70s. So uh, there, there is at least in the version that that I won't read of uh, of uh, mental illness and, and personality, this brief engagement with a more Marxist approach. Is there ever sort of a a lingering um, sort of because um, Marx remains pertinent to a lot of Foucault's research, particularly his treatment of de Lule and Guerri's uh, text, The Productive Body and Discipline and Punish, which of course Americans would have almost zero understanding of because both the, the citation is wrong and, and the translation of the book is wrong in the, um, in the American text. But uh, does the prevalence of a more Marxist approach to psychology and to Dasein analysis, which would, would, of course, take a new purpose in the works of like R.D. Lang and folks like that. Does, do those sympathies affect in any way the research methods of history of madness? Or do you think that this was truly something that Foucault tries to sort of change and try to find a new, a new route to approach uh, the, the problems that, that he Okay, I mean, I can try and say something about that. I mean, Foucault's membership of the Communist Party seems to be largely in the period that he's working at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. So from when he was a student to when he was first teaching there in the first couple of years. And largely the, the sort of influence of, of Louis Althusser, who seemed to have signed up many of his students into a sort of a small kind of cell within the NS. And Foucault's Membership seems to cease in 1953, so it's around the time of the death of Stalin and the exposure of the, the doctor's plot. And Foucault seems to take a sort of a distance from the party at that point. And then, of course, in, in 56, with both what happens in Hungary, but also what happens with the, uh, the Khrushchev speech, that sort of cements that, that break. But by 56, Foucault is outside of France, he's in Uppsala at that point. So there's a, a sort of a short period when he is a paid up member of this, but he was clearly reading Marx and he was clearly engaging with Marx and, and that through his career, um, that continues in different ways in different places through his career. So he, Foucault makes the claim that, that some of the, the things that he does in the history of madness are really quite Marxist, but he says, you know, the Marx without quotation marks, that he didn't need to put the formal references in there to parade his knowledge of Marx. And if the Marxists then miss that, then that's that's kind of too bad for them. And 
there's a kind of a a difficult relation that he has with Marxism. Partly, though, I think against sort of institutional Marxism, the French Communist Party, rather than Marx's own works and the ideas of Marx. There's some places where Foucault is very appreciative of what Marx achieves, mainly as a historian. That seems to be the thing he's most interested in Marx for, rather than perhaps the the economics or the politics. There's, of course, the discussion in um, The Order of Things, where he talks about how Marx's work on political economy can be situated in relation to Ricardo and so on, which annoyed Marxists. But the other thing that's maybe worth saying about Marxists in, in France in the 1960s is, even if they were explicitly Marxist, they were all still disagreeing with each other. They were all still accusing each other of all kinds of infractions of what they had done. So if you look at, you mentioned Althusser and Sartre, but Henri Lefebvre, who I've also worked on, you know, in the positioning of, of just those three, and there are obviously many others, they're all accusing each other of falling into traps, of not doing the right kind of orthodox reading or the breaking with this, or they're not understanding that aspect and so on. So that, that Foucault has a difficult relation with Marxism um, is not in a sense surprising. Um, you can trace some of that through Foucault's work. Again, um, Didier Erebon calls the mental illness and personality, so the 1954 book, I think it's Erebon, it might be Macy, calls it kind of the monument to his party membership. And in a sense, I think that's quite a good way to think about it, is that there is something in there where there's an engagement with what Marxists are trying to do. Is this the way to unlock the problem that Foucault is identifying? But the Foucault then moves away from that. And then if you read the history of madness, even though there might be a Marxist-inspired approach to some of the, the issues or the questions in that book, He's not explicit about that. He, he's not badging it in that kind of way, certainly not a party membership way, but I think not even a close affiliation to the thinker Marx in, in that work. And, and I think maybe this would be a, a good place to now just start to shift to some of the teachers who, who play a, a prominent role, the mentors who play a prominent role. And maybe the first we can go over, because he's already been brought up, is, is Althusser. So... Obviously, Foucault's relationship with Althusser remains uh, relatively, frankly, uh, strong at the personal level throughout uh, the 60s, even though recently there there was that scuff up with a, a lot of graduate students were posting that that famous letter Althusser wrote where he was like, oh, well, we're doing, you know, uh, historical materialism, Derrida and Foucault just both released terrible books. I think it was in reference to, to the archaeology because I think uh, the 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 insult was Foucault wrote a book about himself. Right? It's a methodological text uh, in a sense. Um, and if you could just speak to the the kinds of things uh, Foucault would be exposed to as a result of that uh, mentorship academically, uh, the kinds of works uh, that that he'd come across, and and maybe how the sort of research that he was doing there, and the kinds of intellectual figures in, in the history of thought itself impacted his methodology and, and approach in uh, mental illness and personality and and then eventually culminating in, in the history of madness. Well, Althusser is clearly very important to Foucault, but I wonder whether in, in the period that we're talking about in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, Althusser's principal importance to Foucault is as a teacher and not so much in teaching a particular course, although he did teach courses, and we know that Foucault attended some lectures by him, but mainly that Althusser was preparing the students at the ANS for the aggregation, which is this competitive teaching exam that allows you to then go on a practice as an academic in, in France. And Althusser would lead the philosophy students through this and would prepare them in quite intense ways for a year or two of study in order to be able to take this exam. And Foucault famously failed it on the first attempt and then passed the second time. And Althusser has this quite small group of students where he is, is training them in how to pass this exam. And I think there is, there is a real influence in terms of the, the shaping role that Althusser has to Foucault and others. Derrida is, is a little later, and then onto a slightly younger generation of people like Etienne Balaban, and Pierre Macheret, and so on. It's as a, a kind of a mentor, as a, a somebody who's training them for this particular professional exam, basically. Because I suppose it's important to also say that, that Althusser really hasn't published very much at this time. There's the book on, on Montesquieu, which is one of the earliest things that he publishes, which comes out of lectures. 
But Althusser's kind of first two really important works don't come out until the mid-1960s. So Four Marks and Reading Capital both appear in 1965. And Four Marks, um, the copy of Four Marks that Althusser gave to Foucault is in the Yale Library, which has got the, the archive of Foucault's, many of Foucault's ar- um, library books that Foucault owned that were given to him with dedications. And Althusser writes in there, here's some old things, you know, Althusser. And it's a collection. It's a collection of pieces that Althusser had published before, but the book doesn't come out until 65, by which time Foucault's published three major books of his own and, and so on. So Althusser's work, in a sense, postdates the first important works of, of Foucault, but Althusser is clearly important for, for the reasons that you're, you're suggesting. But I think principally as this person who's helping train the next generation of teachers of philosophy within the French system. So I think that's an important aspect. There's the, the party membership, there's a, a friendship, the friendship that endures, despite the way that they disagree about different things um, in their work over the 60s and 70s and so on. The other thing, and this is something I've not yet done the, the detailed work on, but it's something I want to write about in the book on the 1960s on Foucault, is that Foucault gives copies of his books to Alters there. And the copy of the History of Madness, which is at the EMEC archive in Normandy in France, Althusser's copy of this book is filled with marginal kind of comments and underlinings in different color pens and bits of paper jammed in there. And so Althusser reads this book in a really physical way in terms of how actively engaged he is with this text and marking it up. There's a couple of letters that he sends where he talks about the experience of reading this book and kind of, wow, how amazing this is. Etienne Balabar has deposited his notes from the seminar where Althusser taught this text. That's in, in the EMAC archive in Normandy again. So Althusser is reading and engaging with Foucault in you know, 1962, 1963, very early after that book is published. So the exchange of ideas between them is not just you know, the, the teacher-student. It's an, an exchange of ideas that goes on between the two of them. And it's a, a long-term engagement. Um, it, it endures for, for many years, even though they're often quite critical of each other. It, it seems interesting, too, because just as a um, you know, graduate student in philosophy, uh, there always seems to be this, this notion that you, know, you have the ideological state apparatus, and then you have Foucault, which is in a certain sense a, a sort of critique of, of that approach. In many ways. But it seems to be that even just at the level of like time frame uh, in in uh, the, the the decade preceding that whole academic interaction, Althusser's function for for Foucault is is just largely purely, I get in in the pure sense of the term, academic, right? Uh, and I'm I'm assuming what is sort of latent in in that in that uh, discussion about uh, Foucault passing the exam is at least some some tools must have been left as to how to approach the history of philosophy right because these these general exams uh first of all extremely difficult but but second tend to require a particular way to to work through say uh descartes and to to have just a sufficient account let alone an interpretation of of what's occurring you know between rousseau and montesquieu <laughs> uh and I, I wonder now if we if if we can now move to to maybe a, a teacher who who had a slightly different um, relationship to Foucault and and that of of Hippolyte and Adam here is is the Hegelian I, I I have no idea so I'll let him I'll let him approach this uh, yeah thank you. yeah I was really fascinated by the section on Foucault's original master's thesis with Hippolyte because it. For me, it it just connected so much, so many themes that at least on this show we've covered about Foucault before in terms of not only the early Foucault but also the later turn in the later lectures talking about cynicism and the rejection of games, but also in terms of Foucault's relationship to Bataille, Jean Val, you know, at least this sort of acephalic crowd of, of thinkers in, in in early French period where Hegel is being you know, revived. I was just thinking about in terms of the flight from Hippolyte that Foucault seems to undergo when he's thinking about Hegel. Because you mentioned that in this Hegel essay, essentially he's trying to present, uh, Foucault is, he's trying to present the phenomenology of spirit as the conditions of possibility for a totalizing system of knowledge, 
that can be systematic without contradiction. And you have this sense of an ultimate coherency which flattens out contradiction, which shapes things into a kind of unity of a whole. And I think this is possibly where you get the idea of, as long as as well as the uh, positivity essay from Hegel, of apparatus in the way that Agamben diagnoses it, the idea of a positive system that gives you the rules of the game, that gives you the rules of power and lets you flatten out contradictions by resolving tensions, or at least trying to do so in the discipline of a system itself. And I'm wondering in terms of this this flight from coherency that Foucault seems to do when he tries to escape Hegel, is almost a rejection of Hippolyte himself, because you as, as you as you say in the early parts of the book, he flies away to away from Hippolyte and tries to escape Hegel with the help of these thinkers like Bataille, Blanchot, etc. And they're coming from a very different reading of Hegel coming from Kajev, who Hippolyte, you know, tried to avoid like the play for fear of being <laughs> being influenced. And it's the sense in this, this Kojevian reading of Hegel, which Bataille and et al. try to escape, is the idea of this ultimate coherent system of discourse of knowledge from which nothing can escape. And at which, at the end of which, the only thing that's delimited is it's this kind of void, this limit experience of unknowledge. And this idea of unknowledge you get with Bataille, this rejection of Hegel, it resonates a lot with how I understand, for example, when the, the, the an antique philosophy of politics the idea of rejecting the game as such, rejecting the game as this totalizing positivity, this this systematization of knowledge that tells you how to flatten out all the contradictions. I was wondering how, how you connect Hippolyte and Foucault's reception of the Hippolyte and the Hegelian system like, across his uh, uh, intellectual development. That's a, that's a really difficult question, and I'm not sure I have a very good answer to that. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to do in the the ongoing research, which will be for the next book, is to look at what happens in the 1960s in Foucault, which is all material that I'd read before, but to now reread that in the light of what I've done in the, the book on the 1950s and to think about that, to think about what's happening in the order of things, what's happening in the archaeology of knowledge, and so on. I suppose that the Hippolyte thing is worth mentioning in part, not just because of the Hegel, but because Foucault writes his secondary thesis on Kant. And again, Hippolyte is the, the notional sponsor of that thesis. The story goes that Foucault went to Hippolyte with the history of madness and said, you know, will you be the sponsor of this for, for examination? And Hippolyte said, I'm not the right person for this, but I could be that role for your secondary thesis on, on Kant and the anthropology. Foucault goes to Conguiem to, to be the rapporteur, the sponsor effectively for the, the madness thesis, but not for the, the Kant thesis, where where Hippolyte is the the figure, and how important Hippolyte's reading of Hegel is for sort of the approach that Foucault takes to Kant, I think is quite important. The notes that Foucault has for when he presented that thesis, so the oral presentation of the thesis before the defence of it, it's clear the genesis and structure approach that Hippolyte had used for Hegel is important for how Foucault wants to present Kant, but. In terms of that kind of French Hegelian's dispute, I'm not sure I'm really able to kind of, um, you know, to say anything more than what, what you said about that. I, I think that's an interesting way to read that that debate. You know, Foucault doesn't attend Kajev's seminars, even though it seems that almost everybody else in Paris did at that time. Hippolyte is the one, as you say, is the exception. He didn't want to go because he kind of thought it would cloud his own reading of this. So there's something interesting that's going on with Hegel and, and the, the famous lines, this escape line that you're mentioning in the inaugural lecture at the College de France when Foucault's taking over Hippolyte's chair and is paying tribute to his predecessor in that, that, that chair. And there's the, you know, can we really escape Hegel or, or do we kind of run so far away from him we turn around and there he is. But, so there is that, that kind of question about Foucault's reading of Hegel because if you read later Foucault, the the explicit detailed references to Hegel are largely lacking. He occasionally mentioned Hegel, but he doesn't go into detail about it. But that diploma thesis clearly shows that at a certain period, he had a very detailed knowledge of, of Hegel's work and some of the Hegel scholarship that was then current in France. But how, how you fit that into sort of what's happening in the 1960s when Foucault is really engaging with Bataille, particularly, I think, and Blanchot, in a sense, that's work I still need to do for the 1960s book that I'm, I'm trying to work. Um, I don't think I have much else to say beyond your way of reading, although that sounds quite a plausible way of reading what's happening. Mm. 
Thank if you ever find a if you ever find an Asafal membership card amongst any new papers, pl- please come back on and tell us. <laughs> well, I mean, Foucault certainly read the Asafal journal. There's notes on that in the in the archives, and he certainly knew Bataille's work well. And one thing I have done, which will be in the the 1960s book, is you know Foucault's publishes this um, preface to a transgression essay on Bataille, which is in the critique volume that's a tribute to Bataille uh, just after he's died. But Foucault's also involved in the editing of the Bataille of Complet um, in the early 1970s. And one thing I found fairly early on in doing the archival work was pages of what looked like a prospectus for the Bataille Complete works in Foucault's archive, largely used as scrap paper. And I didn't find a complete single, you know, 10 page document of this, but I did find one copy of every page of this, at least in in other boxes scattered through the archive. Foucault had clearly been given a kind of prospectus of what they were planning to do in the early 1960s, shortly after Bataille died, of where they were going to put this this collection together. It was Jean Bruno, who was another um librarian at the Bibliothèque Nationale who'd, who'd worked with Bataille, who was going to be leading this project. And then uh, Foucault is asked to write a preface to this in 1970. And part of the reason for that is because so much of Bataille's work is going to trouble the censors because of how graphically pornographic a lot of that early material is, some of the novels and the anonymous texts and so on. So they used Foucault, who by 1970 had just been elected to the College de France, and so he's the senior figure in French academia. And Gallimard liked the idea of having Foucault to preface this first volume of the Bataille of, because that would help, they thought, to protect it from censorship uh, and legal problems. So I've, I've tried to reconstruct a little bit of that story in, in the work I'm doing for the 1960s book. Um, Foucault's links to Bataille. But Foucault never met Bataille, as far as I can tell. It, it seems interesting because there's this period, and and obviously you've mentioned that that Foucault's engagement with Bataille is actually a little bit later than we we tend to think, or at least I seem to think in comments that he gave in remarks on Marx. I thought Bataille would be a super early influence because it seems to be at the, in the translated uh, interview remarks on Marx. He talks about he con- there's this fascinating way with which Foucault couples. Uh, theorists when he speaks, when he writes. So in History of Madness, right, it's it's Nerval, uh, Holderlin, Nietzsche, and Artaud, right, and they're always blocked when you when you when you read those sections. So like in in my graduate work, it's always really easy to 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 sort of find what you're looking for, so long as you know that they're usually they're usually blocked together. But uh, Foucault seems to to block Nietzsche and Bataille together there alongside what he would start start to try to articulate is why he would reject the phenomenological framework, right? So Husserl seems to be the the, the figure that really grounds a lot of uh, French thought in, in the 40s. And then, of course, Heidegger, uh, which there are some people who think that, you know, being in time has a phenomenological uh, element to it, right? There's a phenomenological reading of of being in time, which allows for Sartre, right, to, to, to manifest. Um, and he seems to show Bataille as the mechanism that allowed him to break free, but also Nietzsche, who he found in in the fifties and in and well found started to engage with seriously. Can you can you speak a, a little bit to uh, what kind of methodological shifts that might have enabled for the the intellectual figure of Foucault to to take moves for him to make um, in his work? Sure. I mean, Foucault's knowledge of phenomenology is actually quite extensive in the early 1950s. There's a long manuscript called Phenomenology and Psychology, which is going to be published later this year, I understand, which Foucault writes sometime in the early 1950s. It's not exactly clear when, probably around sort of 53, 54, something like that seems likely. Philippe Sabot is editing this and has has done some work reading this, this text. And it's probably links to teaching that Foucault had done, where he was teaching psychology students, or he's teaching psychology to philosophy students, is a better way of putting it, um, both in Lille and at the ANS in Paris. And Foucault clearly knew Husserl very well. I also found correspondence where Foucault had tried to get the rights for philosophy as a rigorous science so that he could translate that text from, from German to French. Quentin Lauer actually was working on it at the same time that Foucault was trying to get rights. And and clearly Foucault becomes aware of this and then he doesn't end up doing this translation. But he was clearly interested in Husserl, interested enough to 
proposed doing a translation, to consult the Husserl archive papers. That there's a copy of, of those at the ANS, as well as the, the famous ones that are in Levin. So Foucault's clearly interested in phenomenology. And Merleau-Ponty was another important teacher for Foucault. And Foucault has clearly read a lot of Merleau-Ponty. He writes about Merleau-Ponty and doesn't publish, but he does write about Merleau-Ponty and, and, and also teaches uh, some of Merleau-Ponty's work to, to students and so on. And then, as you say, there is this, in a sense, a kind of a break where Foucault goes in a different direction. And he does say that Nietzsche is the key figure uh, in that. And the biographies all tell the story about how Foucault's friend, Maurice Pinguet, was remembering how Foucault had had a copy of The Untimely Meditations that he was reading when they were on holiday in Italy. And every time they kind of stopped at a cafe, Foucault would get it out and read a few more pages and so on. And it's a great story, but how much that's absolutely the moment when Foucault discovers Nietzsche is a little bit, I think, open to question. Some of the dates don't quite line up, and I, I talk about that a little bit in the book. But there is something in terms of Foucault's engagement with Nietzsche in the 50s that, that, that is important to him. And there's that famous line in a very late interview where Foucault says it was, it was Nietzsche and Heidegger, that was the philosophical shock. And part of that, I think, is the reading of Heidegger's essays on Nietzsche. So there's an essay, Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's Word, God is Dead, which, which comes out in Hodsberger in 1950. Um, there's a piece, Who is Nietzsche's Zarathustra, which is published in 1954. And Foucault references some of these texts in his lecture notes on philosophical anthropology. So he's clearly reading and engaging with some of that material. And Nietzsche, very important to Foucault, and Bataille as a reader of Nietzsche is important to Foucault, I think, at that time, as well as Heidegger is a reading of, uh, of Nietzsche. Karl Jasper's book on Nietzsche is very important to Foucault. Uh, Foucault's reading Karl Lovitz's work on, on Heidegger and Nietzsche. And this all comes up in notes in, in, that seem to be from the 1950s and then in the, the Philosophical Anthropology course, which again will be published in the next year or so, I understand. So there is definitely a moment when Nietzsche becomes important and that Nietzsche and readers of Nietzsche help Foucault to, I think, develop a, his sort of distinctive voice that is not one that is rooted in the French thought of the 1940s and 1950s, his sort of intellectual formation through his teachers, through his trainers and so on. I think that's an important moment for Foucault and it, it coincides with the period when he moves to Uppsala and in terms of the recorded record, what's in the archives and so on, there's, it, it sort of seems like a silence. It's not really a silence, of course, because teaching in Uppsala, he's giving um, visiting talks, he's writing and writing and writing to, to produce the history of madness. But there's a, a bit of a gap in the, the record of that. And, and then when Foucault comes out the other side of that, and the history of madness is there, it's how did he get from the early 50s work to the history of madness? And I try to, to reconstruct that story as best I can in this book. But there are still things where reading the history of madness again, you know, for that, I don't know how many times when I, I read it right again at the end of writing of this book to, to, to fill in some detail. It's still an astonishing work of how Foucault had got to that point. You know, we forget Foucault was in his early 30s when he wrote The History of Madness. It's, a, it's an, an amazing book that is such a break from work that he had done before then and work of many of the, the teachers that he'd been influenced by. And it's reading people, either people of previous generations of Nietzsche or people of, who were contemporaries of Foucault in some way, but he never met, like Bataille or Heidegger, or it's figures that were important to him that were not really teachers, but were sort of mentors. So Georges Congrium, who I've mentioned, was very important. Uh, but also Georges de Mazil, the mythologist and linguist, who sort of takes on this kind of mentorship role for Foucault in the 1950s, late 1950s. It, he, he meets Foucault around 54, 55, when Foucault is going to get this post in Uppsala. And then de Mazil, who's working in, it seems like quite a different tradition but that Foucault finds, I think, very important as a, as a friend, as somebody who can support him in the French intellectual system, but something in his work that is also important to Foucault. And I think all of those different figures that he's been reading and engaging with and thinking with, coupled with the material on the history of madness that he, he's finding in archives or in the, the library in Uppsala and elsewhere, all of that, I think, kind of you know, mixed together makes the book The History of Madness. 
which is largely complete by sort of 58, 59, it seems. Yeah, I, I, you know, this notion of the silence, that, that tends to be another thing that uh, we, we see also later. And you talk about this in, in a lecture on, on subjectivity and truth. There's sort of all of these different things that, that uh, force a sort of new methodological approach and, and the different way that the, di- the different ways that uh, Foucault approaches the various volumes of the history of sexuality and how we need to sort of be careful when we approach those later volumes. Uh, I know that I, you know, in my initial reading of of, of those texts, I was kind of careless, um, and I saw like this clear break, and I was like, "What happened?" Um, so I had to spend like a year trying to figure out what's going on. But uh, I, I, the the notion of the silence, I think, is 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 important. So we've spoken a lot, and maybe just to round this interview out because we're we're close to the hour. Uh, maybe just to round this out, there's the famous line, uh, "Don't expect me to stay the same," right? Uh, writing without a face and so on, not trying to maintain a particular linearity, a sort of um, low hum where the theorist just becomes the same approach to to problem X, Y, and Z. Obviously, Foucault, if there's anything, one thing that people like to do with Foucault is chop him up into different eras, which, you know, what I appreciate about your text is it's like, no, we're going to do this chronologically, right? Uh, We're not going to try to, 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 to see if we can sort of force a particular interpretation. But the one question that I have is, with all of these changes, where Foucault shifts, whether it be the mid seventies or the early fifties, or the the shift from the the archaeological to the genealogical, and so on, uh, the famous lecture I've had about enough in uh, society must be defended, and which necessitates this new approach. What do, do you think, if anything, remains methodologically for Foucault the same from a particular point in the fifties in this work? Is there anything that I can still find in his later works? I think it's an interesting question and it raises a number of issues about how we approach Foucault and how we read Foucault. I suppose one thing I'd I'd say is Foucault's interested in problems and in trying to understand those problems, he develops concepts that help him to unlock them, to to make sense of them, to try to track traces and so on. And so a lot of the 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 concepts, in a sense, that people take from Foucault, whether it's power knowledge or the dispositif or the technologies of the self or you know many others, those were ones that Foucault develops at a very particular moment in his career because he was interested in a particular problem and that those concepts helped him to make sense of that. And if we then rip those concepts out of that context or that problem that Foucault is interested in, there's a certain violence in terms of how we might read uh, and and use Foucault. And and what's noticeable is that as Foucault moves on to different problems or different historical periods or different questions, some of those earlier concepts sort of get more muted or or disappear entirely and new ones get, get introduced to make sense of those new problems. And I think that what's consistent is that probably from around the mid-1950s, is that Foucault is consistent in approaching these problems historically. I think that in the the early 1950s, from the texts that we have, Foucault is not largely approaching these problems from a historian, historical perspective, let's say. But I think that from the 50s on, you can see that in the history of madness, birth of a clinic, order of things, through into discipline and punish, and the, the history of sexuality. It's that how do we how do we explore this problem? And and he says late in his career, the the way round the problem of the subject is to do a genealogy of the subject. Let's do do a historical examination of how did we get to this point? How did this notion that we seemingly take for granted actually appear? How did that um, arise? How did that get produced out of a series of questions? And that that many of the other concepts or approaches or things that Foucault develops in order to help him to do that kind of work. So I suppose it's the historical way of exploring and the the problem focused approach, and that you follow a problem where the problem takes you. So you know, history of sexuality is a good example of this. In around seventy six, seventy seven, when he's working on what's initially planned to be a second volume of the history of sexuality on confession, and it's largely going to be on the late medieval into the the early modern period, and in exploring that problem, Foucault realizes. This doesn't quite work. The historical material actually goes back further than I thought, that there are different problems at stake here. Okay, I'll follow the problem. And he says this in the, the final version of the 
introduction to the second volume of History of Sexuality is actually published, where he says, you know, I decided that rather than following what I'd already outlined I was going to do, I thought it was more profitable to follow the problem and to, to, to see where that led me. And that, I think, is a really inspiring thing in Foucault's approach, is that it's not a, here is something that, that will fit whatever problem I'm interested in, is that I need to develop the tools to explore a problem that are suitable, that are proper to, that are appropriate to the thing that I'm trying to unlock. And I think from the mid-1950s, that's probably a, a fairly consistent approach that he has. Okay, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great place to leave the, the discussion. If there's, if there's anything else you'd like to add um, about the book? No, I, it is a book that was, was much more challenging to write than the other books I've written on Foucault. And I, I would have said that even before the pandemic made the last part of archival work really difficult to do. I began thinking, you know, is there enough material to write a book on this period? You know, are, are there going to be enough traces? And, and in the end, it was there is so much. How am I going to contain it all, even within what became a, a longer book? So it, it was a challenging book to write, but, but I, I think it, it makes use of material that others can use. The, you know, all of this material in archives is accessible to people. It's not that I've had particularly privileged access or anything. It's just this material has become available in the last eight years or so. And there's just so much more that can be done with this. So in a sense, it's also an invitation for other people to work on it. There are many people working on this period already. I mentioned Philip Sabo, Elisabetta Basso, Ariana Sforzini, who are going to be editing some of those early texts and, and others. So there's a lot that can be done, I think, with this material. It opens up a whole range of ways that we can approach and engage with Foucault.